HD.com. Cervical Spine Trauma. I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. First, we're going to start with some normal anatomy. These are my three rules of three. The predentate space, the space that is indicated here by the red arrow pointing to the thin lucency just in front of the dens should be less than three millimeters in an adult. The prevertebral soft tissue at the level of C3 is usually less than three millimeters. And anterior wedging of three millimeters or more of a vertebral body suggests the presence of a compression fracture. Also important are the three parallel lines that you can imagine on every lateral view of the cervical spine. The red line should smoothly connect the anterior aspects of all of the vertebral bodies. The yellow line should smoothly connect the posterior aspects of all the vertebral bodies. And the blue line shown here should connect the junction between the spinous process and the lamina called the spinolaminar white lines in a smooth curve. All three of these lines should parallel each other smoothly. So let's look at atlanoaxial dislocations starting at the top of the cervical spine and moving down. These are hyperflexion injuries, usually secondary to motor vehicle accidents. C1 will slip forward on C2. There are frequently associated fractures of the skull and or facial bones. Neurologic injury is common, and these are unstable fractures. Here's an example of an atlantoaxial dislocation. You can see that the body of C1, as indicated by the yellow and red arrows, is markedly forward on the body of C2. If you look at the blue line, which is supposed to smoothly connect all the spinal laminar white lines of the spine, it clearly misses posteriorly the spinal laminar white line of C1, indicated by the yellow arrow here. There's a marked increase in the predentate space in the actual radiograph. This measured 15 millimeters. Neural arch fractures of C1 are the most common fractures of C1. These are usually hyperextension injuries. There's no neurologic deficit. They can be confused with congenital anomalies, and you have to be careful of that. This is an example of a neural arch fracture of C1. The red arrow is pointing to a vertical lucency, which is a fracture through the posterior or the neural arch. This, on the other hand, is a congenital defect in the neural arch of C1. You can see that the lucency is surrounded on either side by a sclerotic and somewhat smooth edge. Jefferson fractures of C1 are burst fractures. They are bilateral breaks in the anterior and posterior arches of C1. They are most frequently caused by a compressive force such as occurs in diving accidents when an individual may jump into a swimming pool and hit one's head on the bottom of the pool. The open mouth radiograph in the frontal projection will show bilateral offset of the C1 vertebral body on C2. These are usually not associated with neurologic deficits because the body of C1 actually becomes wider and allows for more space for the spinal cord. This is an example of a Jefferson fracture seen on an open mouth view. You can see that the lateral masses of C1, indicated here by the two white arrows, clearly lie lateral to the edges of the lateral masses of C2, indicated here by the red arrows. When you see this on a frontal radiograph in a patient with trauma, this indicates a Jefferson fracture, a burst fracture of C1. Here's a CT scan of the same patient in which we can see both the right and left fractures of the anterior arch. We can only see the right 
posterior arch fracture on this image. Hangman's fractures of C2 are the most common fracture of C2 and also the most common fracture of the cervical spine. They are fractures through the pedicles of C2 with almost always an anterior slip of C2 on the body of C3. They usually occur as a combination of hyperextension and compression fractures as would occur with unrestrained occupants in motor vehicle collisions and this video that follows that shows what happens to this crash test dummy as an unrestrained occupant is the mechanism by which a hangman's fracture can occur. Hangman's fractures may manifest themselves by a teardrop shaped fracture on the inferior aspect of the body of C2 or C3. So that's an important clue to look for on the lateral radiograph. Hangman's fractures that occur as a result of motor vehicle collisions are not associated with neurologic deficits. And this is an example of a Hangman's fracture of C2. The white arrow points to the vertical lucency, which is the fracture itself through the pedicles of C2. The red arrow points to the anterior subluxation of the anterior aspect of the body of C2. If you look at the red line, it should smoothly connect all of the anterior bodies, but it doesn't. And if you look at the blue line, that should normally smoothly connect all of the spinal laminar white lines but the spinal laminar white line of C2 indicated by the blue arrow is clearly posterior to that blue line. This is an extension teardrop fracture, which can sometimes be the only clue to the presence of a hangman's fracture. The red arrow is pointing to a small avulsion type fracture from the anterior inferior aspect of the body of C2. Dens fractures are usually hyperextension fractures. They usually occur with forward subluxation of C1 on C2. There is a relatively high incidence of non-union of dens fractures, as high as 60%, and they do tend to be stable fractures. There are three major types of dens fractures. The rarest is the very tip of the dens. The most common occurs at the base of the dens, and the next most common is a subdentate fracture. This is an example of a fracture of the base of the dens. The red arrow is pointing to the horizontal lucency, which is the fracture itself. The dens with the D on it is tilted backwards slightly. This is a CT scan in a coronal reformatted version that shows the fracture through the base of the dens in this patient. There are several pitfalls in the diagnosis of a dens fracture. There may be something called a mock line, which may imitate a dens fracture. There may be non-union of the ossification centers of the dens on a congenital basis, or there can be non-union of a previous fracture of the dens. This red arrow points to a black line, which is called a mock line, which is produced as a manifestation of the rods and cones in our retina and our occipital cortices, but actually is not present anatomically. Mock lines always occur adjacent to usually large white structures. In this case, it's the neural arch of C1 indicated by the white arrow. And if you're unsure of whether it's a fracture or a mock line, you could look at the lateral radiograph. The mock line will not be present on the lateral radiograph. A burst fracture results from an axial loading injury, usually secondary to motor vehicle collisions. The disc is driven into the vertebral body below, and it produces a comminuted vertical fracture through the vertebral body. Fragments of the burst may be retropulsed 
posteriorly into the spinal canal, injuring the cord. It can resemble a flexion teardrop fracture of the cervical spine, but in flexion teardrop fractures, there is usually an avulsed anterior inferior triangular fragment separated from the body and displaced anteriorly. In burst fractures, the facet joint and interspinous distances are usually widened, the disc space can be narrowed, and 70% have associated neurologic deficits. This is an example of a burst fracture of C7. The black arrow is pointing to the vertical fracture through the anterior aspect of the body of C7. You can see that there is marked compression of the anterior aspect of the body of C7 and that the posterior aspect of the body of C7 is pushed backwards into the spinal canal. You can also see that the distance indicated by the red arrows between the spinous processes of C6 and C7 is increased. There is soft tissue swelling anteriorly. Simple compression fractures are flexion injuries. There is anterior wedging of three millimeters or more, which suggests a fracture, and they usually involve the superior end plate of the vertebral body. This is an example of a simple compression fracture of the cervical spine. In this case, the white arrow is pointing to the superior end plate of C7, which is depressed anteriorly. Clay shoveler's fractures are avulsion fractures of the spinous process of either C6 or usually C7. They occur as a result of a rotational injury of the trunk relative to the neck. They are named by virtue of the original cause of these fractures, which was in individuals who were shoveling clay in which the clay did not release from the shovel. There's usually no neurologic deficit. They do not involve the spinal canal. And this is an example of a clay shoveler's fracture in which there is a horizontal fracture, in this case through the spinous process of C7 as indicated by the red arrow. This is a CT scan and another patient with a clay shoveler's fracture, the white arrow is pointing to the fracture through the spinous process of C7. Ligamentous injuries usually are produced by a combination of flexion and distraction. The disc space may be narrower anteriorly than posteriorly. There may be widening of the distance between the spinous processes, and there may be widening of the facet joint, especially posteriorly. The ligaments that are injured are the posterior ligamentous complex, and this is an example of a ligamentous injury. You can see that C4 is slightly forward on C5, and the red arrow is pointing to the fact that the facet of C4 is slightly forward on the superior articulating facet of C5. There may be subluxation of the vertebral body, and there may be perched or locked facets. Let's take a moment to talk about normal facet anatomy. The facets are paired structures. In this example, the blinking red line is pointing to the inferior articular facet of C4. And it, you'll notice, is posterior to the superior articular facet of the vertebral body below it, as indicated here by the blinking blue line. The superior articular facet of C5 lies anterior to the inferior articular facet above. That's the normal relationship of the inferior and superior articulating facets. When there are unilateral locked facets, which are caused by a combination of flexion, distraction, and rotation, there's about a 30% association with neurologic defects, 